Well, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Missouri Department of Conservation's wild webcast on wild turkeys in Missouri. Today, we'll be talking about population trends and management. And with us today, we have our wild turkey program leader, who you see on screen there, Raina Tile. And again, thank you for joining our webcast. We're going to do it a little different today, where we will first address some key factors and some common questions on the topic. Raina has a lot of data and information to share, so we'll go through that. And then at the end, we'll take additional questions that we haven't addressed. Some of the common questions we get from folks, Raina, why am I seeing fewer turkeys? And why haven't you eliminated the hen harvest in the fall? Why haven't you reduced the spring bag limit? Why aren't we allowed to trap fur bearers during the nesting season? Is this issue unique to, to Missouri? Why haven't we implemented a predator bounty? And essentially, where have all the turkeys gone? So, Raina, thank you for joining us today to talk about turkey management and population trends and dynamics. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it. And folks, please share your questions with us throughout this. And like I said, what we don't address, we'll address at the end as we have time. So using the chat box on the right side of your webcast screen, you could share your questions there. So let's just get going, shall we? And let's uh, give us an overview of what we're talking about today. Yeah, so today we're gonna start off with an overview of the history of wild turkeys in Missouri. It kind of sets the stage for where we are now and we'll get into that with our current wild turkey population status. We'll talk about wild turkey population dynamics here in the state and what's really driving those. We'll talk about some ongoing wild turkey research that we have, and then at the end, we'll get into some more of those frequently asked questions that you talked about. All right, wonderful. And again, folks, if you have additional questions, please share them in the chat box on the right side of your webcast screen. So turkeys in Missouri, I mean, at one point, they were pretty much gone from the state. Yeah, that's true. At one time, you know, we only had turkeys left in the steepest and deepest portions of the Ozarks because they were nearly um, extirpated or essentially locally extinct from Missouri due to European settlement of the state, um, unregulated harvest before state wildlife agencies existed, um, and habitat loss. So we had, I think it was down to like what we knew of a couple hundred. Yeah, probably that's the most that we had. Um, and so then, you know, we started trying to increase turkey populations after the creation of our state wildlife management agency. And um, originally we tried to establish populations by releasing pen raised turkeys throughout the state. But those releases were unsuccessful just because those birds didn't really have the wherewithal to, with, you know, to, to make it in the wild. Well, right. And what we found too, a lot of times with any game bird that's raised in captivity, pheasants, quail, when you release them, they don't just really have the instincts to survive. And mm -hmm. so they don't. That's true. So um, it wasn't really until, you know, MDC began intensively managing some of our state-owned areas where we had remnant turkey populations. Um, there was also a moratorium on turkey hunting, so you could not harvest turkeys during that time. And through that habitat management and, you know, no harvest of turkeys, those small populations began to grow. But it wasn't until the mid-50s when we invented this thing called the rocket net that we were really able to capture wild birds and move them elsewhere. Right, and now that is their, like, cannons or rockets um, with netting attached, and literally, you put some bait down for the turkeys or other wildlife, they kind of gather underneath that area, mm -hmm. and then boom, you literally shoot these nets over them to capture them in large numbers. Yep, that's exactly right. And then we would box up the birds and move them to suitable sites throughout the state that we had identified as a good release site. The Kingy Mountain Conservation Area down in the Ozarks was one of those key areas, I, I believe. Yep, and even throughout this time, you know, what biologists considered to be good turkey habitat changed when we had a successful release up north in Adair County. Um, previously, folks thought you needed to have really big tracts of forest cover for them to survive, but um, with that release, we realized, you know, turkeys could survive in the more northern parts of the state too, and so, uh, you know, over 2,600 turkeys being released to 200 sites in 91 counties. Um, you know, once that happened, or in the late 1970s, that, that restoration effort was over and, and we'd moved turkeys a lot of places in Missouri. Right, and we released them in sites in 91 counties, but we know that they pretty much quickly spread throughout the entire state. 
So there were wild turkeys in pretty much every county. Yeah, so those are the places we released them, but obviously the, once we released those birds, their populations began to grow right. and expand. And so um, pretty soon we had turkeys in all 114 yeah. counties. Kind of nature finds a way to fill those voids. Mm -hmm. Right, so they peaked in the, in the mid 2000s, and then tell us about all of that and then what happened? Yeah, so after the restoration effort was completed, kind of in the late 1970s, those populations grew and expanded throughout the state. Um, our numbers began to grow during that time uh, pretty rapidly. And then in the early to mid 2000s is when we saw our peak turkey abundance and also some of our peak harvest. Uh, after that time though, we did see a decline in our harvest by about 25% statewide during the mid to late 2000s. And then we kind of started seeing some you know, increased abundance due to some good years of production and some lower abundance due to poor years of production. And recently we've had a few years in a row of relatively poor turkey production. And so we've been seeing further declines uh, in turkey abundance. Right, and I know a lot of older turkey hunters in the state remember those 2000s when turkey numbers were at their peak. And now they're, you know, they're asking where are all the turkeys now, but that decline from that peak, is that just kind of, isn't that normal? with wildlife and things like that? Yeah, so a lot of times when you have a restored population, you get this period of exponential growth right after, or once you know numbers get to this critical level where they really start reproducing well. A lot of times though, you'll end up kind of overshooting mm -hmm. the natural carrying capacity and there'll be a period of dieback then where mm -hmm. uh, the population is just trying to figure out, okay, how much, how many of us can the landscape really sustain? Right. Uh, and then in an established population, so after you have that initial restoration curve, uh, you tend to see fluctuations from year to year or on several year cycles of you know greater numbers and lower numbers based on a variety of factors. Unfortunately, what we've been seeing, though, is this pattern of dampened oscillation where the next high peak is not as high as the peak before and the next low, you know, trough in numbers is a little bit lower than the trough before. And so, you know, instead of seeing a cyclical kind of pattern just around carrying capacity, we're actually seeing a declining trend through time, even with those cycles. Okay, so quickly, the, the graphs that we have up here, that first one that shows kind of that, that peak period and then how that that dampened oscillation, how it kind of varied in mm -hmm. that wave. But and, yeah. and then on the uh, on the right, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so on the right, we've got a graph of just our spring harvest there in orange, but then also harvest and permit sales as a ratio. So basically mm -hmm. harvest standardized by the number of permits. And you can kind of see there, you know, we've got this, you know, up and down trend after about 2005, but on a long-term scale there, it's it's slightly declining through time. Okay, and, and we're going to talk about that as far as kind of the wild turkey decline or, you know, that downward trend, what impacts that? So let's kind of get into that. Yeah, so when we think about wildlife population sizes, you know, there's several things that impact the number of individuals that are out there. Um, you have a couple of different inputs, whether it's, you know, production of new individuals or just survival of individuals from year to year and them being retained in that population. And then you have outputs like natural mortality from predation and other things, um, but also harvest from, from us in the case of turkeys, which are a very popular game bird. Um, and so all these things together kind of determine what your population size is, but okay. they don't all have an equal role. Okay, and I always kind of joke, you know, a lot of folks, math <laughs> is hard, but this is kind of that new math where again, production plus survival minus mortality and harvest that's what equals our population size. So let's learn more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so through time, we've had a couple of turkey studies where we've looked at various different vital rates or survival and reproductive rates uh, through time. So we had this study back in the 1980s when our turkey population was growing in abundance and expanding throughout the state. And then recently we had another study in a similar area up in North Missouri during the mid to late 2010s when, you know, after we'd reach our, reached our peak abundance, we'd seen um, a decline in numbers in that area and the population in that area was kind of stable to decreasing. And so we can compare rates during those two different studies to see, you know, what's the same as it was when mm -hmm. turkeys were doing good and what's different. And that can help us identify what the issue is. Okay, so again, you know, looking at past and present research mm -hmm. to come up with hopefully some answers. 
Yeah, so when we compared the results of those studies, we see that the annual survival of our, I guess, adult birds or mm -hmm. larger birds, you know, hens, jakes, and gobblers were as good or better than when our turkey population was growing. So survival hasn't really changed. You know, if there was something out there that was reducing survival of our adult birds, we would have expected to see survival be lower than it right. was in the 80s. Okay. Um, but it was actually doing, we're actually doing pretty pretty good on that side of the so equation. So if they achieve adulthood, they're kind of doing okay as well, they've been. They're do yeah, they're doing as well as they were when the turkey population right. was growing, essentially. Okay. Um, and we looked at our harvest rates too, and what we found is that our spring harvest rates are still low compared to what's considered sustainable, and our fall harvest rates during that study were actually lower than, than what it was during that study during, in, during the 80s. And so if we're removing a similar or lower proportion of individuals through harvest, um, you know, that isn't a red flag either, you know, so that kind of tells us that it's not perhaps the harvest side of the equation that's driving the changes in population size. Okay, and we're going to talk a bit more about harvest and some mm -hmm. of those, again, commonly asked questions about adjusting spring and fall harvest and, and potential impacts, but it looks now um, that production is that main factor. Yeah, and that's pretty much the main result of that study is we found that several of our reproductive rates are lower, um, some significantly lower than they were uh, back in the 1980s when that previous study had been conducted. So I wanted to give folks a visual of this so they're not just taking my word for it. Uh, this first graph here on the left is our hen survival during the 80s in that orange color, uh, and then our recent study in the more kind of reddish orange cover color. So you can see our annual survival rate of our hens is, is similar or perhaps even a little bit greater than it right. was. Right, okay. Um, our fall harvest rate is lower than it was in the past for hens in the fall. So in the 80s, it was about 4% of hens being removed during our fall seasons. And recently, it was closer to 1% uh, being removed. Okay, so fewer hens being harvested, mm -hmm. as bad as many hens surviving. So it looks like this third bar graph is really getting into the whys of it. Yeah, so that's where things get interesting. Um, some of our reproductive rates are lower, you know, like nest success, female success. Nest success is basically the proportion of individual nests that hatch. Uh, female success is the proportion of hens that are successful in producing a clutch. Um, and then poult survival being kind of the big red flag here because it's about half of what it was right. back in the 80s. Right. We saw on average during our recent study, 23% of poults surviving their first four weeks of life. Uh, and back in the 80s, that was closer to 46%. And so, yeah, half of what, half of what we were, which is kind of stark. <laughs> right, and so this next sheet gives us kind of a closer look at what we were just talking about. Yeah, and we use you know, an index that we get from our brood survey in the summertime, our poult to hen ratios, to get a general idea of what production is like from year to year. And so back in the 80s, when we were conducting that study, we were seeing an average poult to hen ratio of about 3.1. Uh, and then recent, more recently with the new study, you know, we were seeing an average poult to hen ratio during that time of about 1.1. So it's it's kind of no surprise that we found some of our reproductive rates were lower because we're seeing those trends occur in our brood survey data. Okay, so when we do this brood survey, we have staff and volunteers throughout the state that go around and and explain quickly and briefly and simply, I guess, that brood survey. Yeah, so during the months of June, July, and August, MDC staff and volunteers that are interested in helping out uh, basically write down observations of any turkeys they see uh, but particularly hens and hens with poults. And then we can use the observations from those uh, summer, you know, root survey cards that people fill out to calculate how many poults were seen per each hen that was observed. Okay. And again, just simply back in the day, it was three poults per hen, and now mm -hmm. we're down to one or sometimes even none per hen. One or sometimes lower than one. Lower than one. Yeah. Okay. So... Again, big question, why am I seeing fewer turkeys? So we've kind of touched on that. Tell us more. So part of the reason is just where we're at in the restoration history, that having that period of dieback after overshooting the carrying capacity, you're gonna see a lower abundance through time, or you're gonna see abundance kind of fluctuate around a lower carrying capacity than that peak abundance. 
Um, but another thing that has contributed pretty significantly is this long-term declining trend in production that we've seen. And then also those recent years of poor production, just fewer individuals being produced and being added to the population um, is going to have an impact, even if survival is the same, because a certain portion will die each year. So oh, Right. And then that leads to one of those other very common questions. Why don't we just stock more turkeys? <laughs> yeah. So in established populations, you know, any birds that we were we would move to a new area are going to experience the same pressures that the that the birds that are already there are experiencing. So if the birds that are already there are not producing very well, the new birds that we would move there are likely also not going to produce young very well. Um, and so you end up kind of just with about as many birds as you release. So if you release 100 birds into an area, you're probably going to have about 100 more birds there. Um, it ends up being more like a put and take, like you would do with pheasants. Right. For a like short that. term, mm -hmm. you may have an influx of more birds in an area, but as you kind of explained with the survival rates and the production rates, that's not going to be sustainable. No, you wouldn't see it um, appreciate into any big increase in abundance down the line because they're not going to be producing, you know, like the ones okay. that already exist. Right, so restocking is really not a solution to our current problem. No, not in established populations. Okay. It's not. So what is influencing production? So we have some thoughts, obviously, about various factors that could be influencing production. Um, you know, we've seen increasing populations of some of our nest predator species and other predator species over the last several decades. Uh, we've seen a loss in the quality of our nesting and brood rearing habitat, but also probably the abundance as well. Um, just herbaceous areas being put into agricultural production that previously were maybe marginal or, you know, weren't um, used for that purpose. We've seen uh, a forest maturation, especially in the southern part of our state, basically just not as much active timber management or harvesting, leading to a bunch of closed canopy forests that don't have any grasses or, you know, flowers or leafy forbs on the forest floor that provide insects for poults and nesting cover and, and all of that good stuff. And I know coming up, um, we have some slides that show kind of ideal habitat or preferred habitat. Mm -hmm. But looking at these graphs on the screen right now, um, there appears to be an increase in small predators, mm -hmm. such as, and we talk about that, this is primarily raccoons, but we're also talking about some possums and skunks. So those are those smaller predators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, and this other graph here shows basically long-term trends in, in precipitation. And we can see just in that highlighted last portion of the graph, that's about the last 15 years or so, and we've been in this wet cycle. And we know that, you know, weather, and especially rain can have negative impacts on nesting and poult survival. Um, and so we're seeing potentially wetter springs than right. they were back in the 80s right. when they were doing pretty well. Um, right. And even this week yeah. is a great example of we went through several weeks of drought and then torrential rains. Mm -hmm. So that's a really kind of busy graph with the green and the orange. But that takeaway is the far right, that big section of green that's mm -hmm. as extreme or even maybe more extreme than the recent past, that's those wet springs that really hamper production. So if we understand this, um, also lower insect abundance. Yeah, uh, some other disciplines in ecology, people that study bluebirds and things that eat a lot of insects have noticed this long-term declining trend in insect abundance through time. and you know, invertebrates and insects are a main source of food for poults, especially our young poults. And right, so, and it's that added protein that they need for that growth spurt during that first year. Exactly, and the quicker that they can eat food and grow, the quicker they can fly, and as soon as they can fly and get off the ground, they can avoid predators a lot better. So the, better so the first two survive. weeks are for those young poults, and if there's fewer insects out there, they're going they're going to have to spend a lot more time foraging, um, putting more effort into foraging to get the food that they need, and potentially might you know not be able to fly as quickly, and that can have impacts on their survival. Oh, very much so. So we're talking about nest success and poult survival. So tell us a bit more about kind of the research and your project objectives. Yeah, so we've been talking about that last study that occurred from 2014 to 2019, and it, it basically identified, you know, 
that some of our reproductive rates are lower, but it wasn't designed to tell us why mm -hmm. it's lower. So we've developed this new study and we're working on it right now. And the main goal is to look at all those things we talked about. So weather, uh, landscape characteristics, both you know, micro habitat around nests and in areas broods are using, but also how the landscape is laid out and how patches of habitat are laid out on the landscape, uh, predator densities and their spatial distribution and invertebrate abundance and look at how all of those things and their interactions with one another could potentially be limiting wild turkey nest success and poult survival. And we also, with this study, hope to identify some of the main causes of poult mortality. So in the past, we've done poult monitoring on a brood level. You know, we see that hen hatched 10 eggs. Two weeks later, she had five poults with her. You know, two weeks later, she had four poults with her. But we don't know exactly why those poults right. died. What happened? And so our hope is to be able to tag and monitor individual turkey poults so that we can get at exactly what is causing most of their mortality and when. And another huge piece of this puzzle is looking at brood rearing habitat selection. Since that poult survival part of the equation is significantly lower than it was, we want to figure out, you know, what are the important characteristics of quality brood rearing habitat? Basically, what does it look like? How can we get more of it on the landscape? Um, but also, you know, where are turkeys and predators most likely to interact? How can we mitigate those negative interactions with better habitat and how it's laid out on the landscape? Um, essentially, what can we do to give those poults a better chance? Well, right, and you and we keep talking about habitat and all of that. And again, as a reminder, um, something like 97% of land in Missouri is privately owned. So it's up to landowners to really take charge of that habitat. Now, we work with tens of thousands of landowners and have just an array of offerings and, and assistance that we can give them. But again, it's mostly private land in the state and developing that habitat, therefore, is, is kind of up to the landowners. Yeah, and we obviously invest a lot of time and, and energy into that. We have a whole branch of our department. That right. Their whole job is to work with private land owners and try to get better habitat on the landscape. So if anyone out there is looking to improve wildlife habitat on their property, they should contact their local private land conservationist and they can find their information on our website. Wonderful. Wonderful. So so looking at kind of these factors, again, mm -hmm. nesting success and poult survival. Tell us more about this study. So this study is going to occur up in North Missouri in Putnam County. And the reason we chose this area is because North Missouri in the last couple of decades has experienced some of the steepest declines in abundance across the state. Um, there's also a big diversity of land cover types in this county. So in the eastern part, there's larger patches of deciduous, deciduous forest. And then in the western part of the county, it's a lot more open and agriculturally dominated. It also overlaps that last study where we From saw- back in the 80s? Um, no, the one that oh, we did okay, the most recent in 2014 one. Okay. and 2019. It overlaps that study area. And so we'll be able to look at you know, reproduction over a pretty long period of time. Um, and some of the results from this study will, we will be able to apply to other places of the state. You know, So when we can figure out what size, shape, and the structure of good you know, broodering habitat looks like, we can implement those same things elsewhere in Missouri as well. Okay, so, and again, with this research study, this slide shows us a little bit about what y'all do, but then quickly, quickly uh, describe. Yeah, so there's a lot involved with this. Obviously, we're looking at a bunch of different factors, so trying to measure those is complicated. Um, it starts with marking 50 hens each winter with GPS transmitters so we can track them throughout the spring and summer. Um, and that's what we use to basically figure out when they're nesting, where they're nesting, if they're successful or not, and if their poults survive or not. Um, we also, again, if our hens are successful, we're capturing those broods and marking and monitoring those individual poults to figure out their causes of mortality. And then a whole bunch of other data collections so that we can you know, model nest success and poult survival and figure out what are what's the main factor that's influencing these. So we've been uh, trapping nest predators like raccoons and possums and marking them with ear tags. And then when we recapture them, we can use that information to estimate their densities in different habitat types. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have been putting out trail cameras and scent stations so that we can get an idea of how many larger predators like coyotes and bobcats and foxes are out there and 
where they exist on the landscape and how they mm -hmm. could be influencing pulse survival. We're also measuring vegetation at both nest sites and areas that broods are using, and also just random sites throughout the county to get an idea of what's available versus what are they selecting for. Uh, and we're also basically collecting insects at these sites so that we can get an idea of insect abundance across these different habitats. Again, well. Which is vitally important for pulp survival and growth. Mm -hmm. And then you're also taking into account temperature, precipitation, mm -hmm. again, that weather factor. Yep. And here we get to kind of that habitat that, that we're looking for. So tell us more about that. Yeah, so one of the big outcomes of this study, you know, there are certain things we can't control, like the weather, but mm -hmm. we can put better habitat on the landscape that can buffer turkeys and their poults from bad weather, but also from predators. And so these are some of the questions that we're kind of hoping to answer so we can, you know, use this to apply it to habitat management. You know, how can we increase probability of nest success and poult survival through the way we manipulate habitat? You know, what sort of vegetative structures provide the best cover from weather and predators? Um, and what sort of structures provide the best foraging areas for broods? Makes it easy for them to move through and also has a bunch of insects around for them to eat. Right, and then the photos on here kind of describe that where that first year that field is just kind of green. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're going to look at these different vegetative communities. A lot of them tend to be really herbaceous dominated, but especially have a lot of flowering plants in them because those tend to be where most of the bugs are. Um, and so we're going to look at those sorts of, of habitat types and see how we might be able to get more of these on the, on the landscape. So. And then that, that lower mm -hmm. picture of a savanna oak uh, area that's kind of that ideal where there's some open area, savanna, yeah. with some mature trees scattered throughout that. That's kind of nesting for adult birds and escape that way. It also provides some cover. And as you were saying, they need that variety of shrubs and flowering plants, which then draw insects, which then serve mm -hmm. as food. So a diverse wildlife habitat. Exactly. Um, and it's it's not just the herbaceous cover that provides the food, but they also need to have places to escape from. And so not only do we need these habitat patches, but how are they laid out on the landscape in proximity to good escape cover so that when predators come, they have places to hide or they have trees to fly up into once they're old enough to do that. Um, because if, if it's just a big open field and they don't have any cover around to escape from predators, they might only use the edges of it. So how can we best, you know, set habitat out on the landscape that provides the most benefit. Right, for and, ag and again, we work with thousands of landowners to really produce habitat. So if I understand this right, you know, just a big open field for grazing and nothing else, or, you know, row crops, that doesn't really provide what the turkeys need. Yeah, and that's part of what we're trying to figure out. And we'll get a really detailed idea of the hen's movements and how they're using different habitat types through these transmitters we have on them. Um, we'll be able to determine not only where they're going, but how they're using that through the, we have accelerometers on the transmitters that can let us know if they're foraging or if they're just moving through an area. Oh. So that will help us, you know, figure out and key in on some of these habitat qualities. Fascinating. And again, folks, we're going to get into some frequently asked questions in more depth now. But if you have additional questions, please share them through the chat box on the right side of your screen and we'll address what we can once we finish with these. So some common questions, Raina, why not incentivize removing nest predators? Yeah, this is a question that we get asked quite a bit from folks who, you know, a lot of people think, you know, we've got more nest predators now, so we just, we need to remove them in order to give turkeys a chance. Um, Nest predator incentive programs, though, can be kind of tricky. So even if you increase removal of predators, doing that enough and on a broad enough scale that it's going to have a benefit for other species, they've rarely been shown to be effective at that in the past when we've had programs like this or other states have had programs like that. Um, they can be really costly, too, and there's usually lots of opportunity for fraud with the programs as well. And so 
we often think you know it's better to put any resources that we might allocate for something like this into habitat management or something that could have a more long-term effect right those more major factors mm -hmm. and again if if you remove nest predators from a local area that's possible for the short time benefit but it's really difficult on a large scale and over time because exactly. you remove a raccoon another raccoon eventually is going to take its place exactly so implementing this the sort of really intensive removal on a you can do it during short time periods in a small area right. if you have really intensive trapping efforts but in order to implement that on a long on a large scale and over a long period of time it's quite difficult and that kind of gets us into another common question why don't we just extend trapping predator trapping fur bear trapping more into the spring yeah so there have been some recent studies that have come out showing that if you do effectively you know remove predators in a small area um, you know right before or during the nesting season for a lot of these ground nesting birds you can see some short-term positive impacts on nest success so because of that we've had a lot of folks asking us you know why don't you allow us to do this um, and I will say that's something that we're looking at in later this summer or into the fall we're going to start reviewing our fur bear trapping and hunting regulations and going through different processes for those um, and implementing something along these lines is something that we will consider when we go through that. Okay, so we're, we're looking into it. Mm -hmm. And then again, why not eliminate the fall hen harvest? Won't that fix things? Right. Or so help? <laughs> in the past, you know, work showed that you could remove about 10% of your population in the fall and not see any impacts on population growth. But obviously, those were conducted during a time where turkey populations were rapidly growing and expanding mm -hmm. and, and could withstand more harvest, more harvest in the fall. So more contemporary work um, looking at established populations like what we have here in Missouri shows us that, you know, you can harvest about 4% or lower of your fall population or of your turkey population in the fall without seeing negative effects on the population growth rate. And our recent, you know, look at our harvest rate in North Missouri was showing us we're removing about 1% of the population, both males and females, um, during the fall season. Okay, so we can get up to about 4% before seeing any kind of negative effects to the population. And now we're only at about 1%, so we're well within that range. So the fall yeah. harvest isn't really having an impact on overall long-term turkey numbers. Well, we did take it a step further and we looked at, you know, we have this 1% removal in the fall with our current season structure. If we were to change our fall season regulations, mm -hmm. you know, if we were to do some alternative regulations like, you know, making this, the fall firearm season shorter or lowering the bag limit, um, reducing or making it so you can only harvest adult males during archery season or completely closing the fall firearms and archery seasons, essentially setting that 1% harvest rate down to 0% mm -hmm. harvest in the fall, you know, how would the turkey population respond? Right. Would we see abundance stabilize? Would we see the population grow in abundance? Um, and what we found is even under the most conservative scenario, which would be completely closing that, the fall seasons mm -hmm. and not allowing any harvest of hens during that time, um, the turkey population, just given our current reproductive rates and survival rates, would continue to decline five years time. So this graph, we basically looked at if we had a, a year zero, so a current population of just over um, 413,000 birds, and if we you know, projected what our population size would be five years down the line under our current season structure and under a closed season, what would that look like? And as you can see, both of them declined um, in five years time. And there was only a difference of about 10,000 birds down the road. So we might have up to 10,000 more turkeys on the landscape five years down the right. road. And I mean, 10,000 is a big number and that's great. So that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Putting that into perspective, if we kind of have a guesstimate starting at about 400,000 birds. Mm -hmm. And that's also throughout the state. Yeah, that would be so, on the statewide Yeah, 10,000 birds throughout the state. I mean, that's an mm -hmm. increase, but not significant. No, not really. The main picture here is that closing the fall season doesn't cause the turkey population to grow in abundance. Right, but it does eliminate uh, fall hunting opportunities. Exactly, it would take away a lot of opportunity without having the desired effect, which is essentially increasing or stabilizing our turkey population. 
Okay, and then again, will more, we talked about this, but more information on it, a more conservative fall hunting regulations, those really wouldn't have a big yeah. impact on stabilizing so this, turkey numbers. This is the takeaway is when our harvest rates are low, which they are right now at about right. 1%, um, any changes to those aren't going to have a substantial effect on abundance. And this graph just shows our, you know, fall archery harvest totals through time. And we've been, you know, that the number of birds we've been removing in the fall has been considerably declining throughout the years. So there's no big, you know, it, it's not like all of a sudden harvest is going to jump up to 10% in the fall and we're going to be in a bad place. Um, there's literally no magic bullet. Yeah, in the, up until in the last fall, we were removing fewer and fewer turkeys pretty much every fall season for the last several years. And this graph also kind of shows that peak period back in the 80s we talked about where it reached a high point. Mm -hmm. And then although there's some peaks and valleys throughout, it is, again, a downward trending mm -hmm. um, graph. Yeah. A big question we get, is this unique to Missouri? So, no. As far as what we're seeing on the production side of the equation, you know, a lot of states across the eastern turkey range have been seeing declining trends in turkey production. Um, some states are starting to see their turkey populations kind of, I guess, reach their peak abundance like us and maybe starting to drop off. Uh, they're kind of so, behind the curve where we were, yeah. so they're experiencing similar things just later on. Yeah, and part of that just has to do with the restoration history. Mm -hmm. Missouri was really on the forefront of turkey restoration, um, and so we saw our turkey abundance increase, you know, earlier than some of these other states. And so now um, they're a little bit delayed with seeing some of the negative effects, but they're all, you know, concerned about about their turkey populations as well and trying to figure out how they can, you know, get production to improve so that they can mitigate some of the abundance declines they might see in the future. Okay, so if I'm hearing this, it's it's kind of unique to most of the range of the eastern wild turkey, where there's some declines in numbers, and the exceptions are conservationary um, efforts that are really repopulating them recently or at this point. That's where we're seeing increases, but yeah. once you have an established population, Mm -hmm. There's really that downward trend throughout most of the range. Yeah, a lot of states are are seeing that. There's still some sta states that are seeing increases in their turkey populations. A lot, some states up north that were just you know a little bit later on the restoration timeline are still seeing some of those increases, but they are still they're seeing declining trends in in production. So they know it's only a matter of time until that decline in production catches up with their abundance and they start seeing effects to abundance. Okay. Um, we talked about fall harvest and changing those regs aren't going to have a significant impact. Mm -hmm. What about spring harvest when, you know, most of the harvest takes place? Yeah. So spring harvest is kind of interesting because unlike fall harvest that can have impacts to population growth because hens are harvested and, and all of that, spring harvest is primarily just males or restricted to the male segment of the population except for a few bearded hens. And so spring harvest and our regulations are really designed to maximize hunt quality. So maximize the number of adult males or gobblers on the landscape um, because having more gobblers on the landscape leads to a higher quality hunting experience. Right, it's better hunting if you could hear more gobblers exactly. and call them in. That's what gobbling is what, what drives turkey hunting quality. Um, and so what we find is when spring harvest of, of males reaches 30% or higher, so you're removing 30% of your male population um, each spring season, you can start to see negative impacts on hunt quality. Um, so once you go over that 30% removal of males in the spring, your proportion of adult males in the spring harvest tends to get lower than 70%. And that's the threshold where hunt quality really starts to diminish. But right now in Missouri, we're seeing about 80% of the turkeys that we harvest in the spring being adult males. Um, which basically means there's still enough of them on the landscape to provide a good quality hunting experience and to provide good opportunity to harvest an adult male. And when you say those are the big toms, yeah, not the jakes, mm -hmm. but those adult males. And if I'm understanding this, we have to hit that harvest rate about 30% before we see a negative impact. Mm -hmm. And where are we now? So the last study we did up in northeastern Missouri, we saw a male harvest rate, so both jakes and toms, 
of about 14%, and our adult male harvest rate was about 23%. Um, we know that you know these rates are likely higher down in the southern part of the state where we might get more hunting pressure on certain areas. Um, but considering up north it was only 14% of the male mm -hmm. population, the odds of it being 30 or higher, it, it might not be, but we are looking to evaluate our harvest rates down there starting this winter. We're going to be doing a new study to look at some harvest rates in the south just to make sure that um, you know they're within what is considered sustainable. Okay, and again, folks, let me remind you to please share your questions, um, and we will take those as we can at the end, but please use the chat box. We can't get your questions unless you enter them and submit them in the chat box on the right side of your webcast screen. Um, so as we look at this again, spring harvest, we're well within those ranges for harvesting the, both the toms and the jakes. Yeah. So changing that's not going to have a big impact? No, not big impacts on, on turkey abundance. But again, you know, spring harvest doesn't really impact overall abundance of your population. It really just impacts the abundance and the age structure of your male turkey. Right. Population. And the spring season is always after that primary like mating and nesting or an early nesting. Exactly. So here in Missouri, uh, we time our spring season to open after most of the breeding has occurred. So after peak breeding. And that basically means that, you know, once the males have bred hens and the hens are going and doing their nesting activities, removal of those males is not going to affect reproduction. The only time you can really see, you know, male harvest start to affect turkey abundance or turkey reproduction is when you open your season too early and you can negatively impact breeding activity. Right, you take out too many males before the breeding season, so mm -hmm. there's not enough left to breed, but by doing it after, yeah. you still have plenty. And even looking at our harvest rate, that, that numbers is, is real good. Um, yeah, and that's an important concept. And I have people, you know, that email me and ask, you know, why can't we open sooner like some other states? Right. But as soon as we explain, you know, this is why it is, they kind of go, okay, I understand, and I don't want to see any negative impacts to our turkey population. So it makes sense to them why why it is the way that it is. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, another common question we get, you know, why why should you be allowed to say take two turkeys in the spring? Why don't we reduce that harvest down mm -hmm. to one turkey? And we have some interesting information on really what those harvest um, kind of trends and limits are. Yeah, so it just seems somewhat obvious to folks. They think, okay, if we lower the bag limit to one, it's going to greatly reduce our spring harvest and we're just going to have way more turkeys out there. But what we've actually found is that only about 5% of our spring turkey hunters fill both of their tags. So it's a pretty small proportion of our spring harvest that's attributed to birds being harvested on that second tag. Um, over the last several years, it's been about 17% of the harvest on average, which if we were to go back to one, a one bird bag limit, we might reduce our spring harvest by 6,000 turkeys mm -hmm. on a statewide scale or something like that. But again, on a statewide scale, 6,000 might seem like a large number, but on a statewide mm -hmm. scale, when we're talking hundreds of thousands, that's not really a big impact. No, and it would take away a lot of hunting opportunity, right? I mean, if, if you have yeah, your first bird on your first day, um, and then you, you're basically done for the rest of the season. And so um, if allowing folks to harvest two turkeys if they want to, only a few mm -hmm. people actually take advantage of that, and it's not having a negative impact on our turkey population by you know over harvesting adult males or anything like that then we might as well keep providing that opportunity well right and you know our work is essentially to conserve our fish forest and wildlife resources of the state so managing our game species is critical to us but it's also about the people in the state and providing those hunting opportunities for the game that we're managing Exactly. So again, like we said, if you reduce that to one, folks won't be able to even even if you don't harvest a bird, it's still great to go out there and try. Yeah, and you're exactly right. That's one of the main objectives of our new turkey management plan is providing optimal hunting opportunities, you know, within what the resource can sustain and based on the desires of hunters. And so we take all of that into a, into account when we're when we're you know evaluating our regulations every year. Right. And as you know, we talked about 
allowing two birds that extends that hunting opportunity for so many people mm -hmm. and this information too again 80 percent of the harvest is during the first two weeks yeah so we see the vast majority of the harvest occur during the first two weeks of the season um some folks will ask us you know we should shorten the season to to reduce our spring harvest and and it would um you know potentially reduce harvest by about 20 percent or less um but it also would take away substantial hunting opportunity especially for folks that are already limited in the time that they have to go hunting right um, and so again our spring harvest rates are within what is considered sustainable even given our current trends and so if taking away that opportunity isn't going to greatly increase turkey abundance or have all these positive impacts then we're just taking right. away that opportunity for right and in the successful harvest is I mean, a great joy of, of the hunt, but mm -hmm. it's so much about just being out there and the whole process and experience of the hunt and being out there. Mm -hmm. So again, this would eliminate those opportunities and we don't need to, research says that we're well within our sustainable levels. Yeah, and right? people, you know, they have trouble finding time to get out um, and hunt, you know, with our busy schedules these days anyways. And so removing an entire week from our spring season, you know, we already have some of the most conservative spring regulations of, of any state. And so that would just greatly, you know, reduce that opportunity okay. for folks. All right, so um, that kind of wraps up this presentation part. And now we wanna take some questions. And even if we kind of have to go over some of the points we made briefly, uh, Mary wants to know, how do you volunteer to participate in the brood surveys? Yeah, so one of the things that you can do to volunteer in the brood sur or to participate in the brood survey is email us at wildturkeymgmt or management at mdc.mo.gov. Um, and then we just need your name and mailing address so we know where to send the brood survey cards okay. to. We'll add you to our mailing list. All right, uh, Raina, I don't want to put you on the spot. Could they email you too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Email and me. again, folks, you see Raina Tile, so that would be Raina.tile at mdc.mo.gov. Yep. Either so email it's either that or what was that email address again? Wild Turkey Management or MGMT at so, mdc.mo.gov. So Wild Turkey MGMT at mdc.mo.gov. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Mary. Andrew wants to know do you have any advice on how long to wait? before say cutting hay and what are the poults old enough to survive kind of without that cover so the first question as far as cutting hay you know most of based on the the peaks in incubation and when most nests should hatch they usually the peak hatch occurs in early june so i always tell folks mid june to late june um, if you're trying to you know reduce your impact on nesting activities we do get a lot of renesting activities though that goes into June, so there's still going to be a chance that you could, you know, impact nests through hang. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of it's kind of difficult in that regard. And I know a lot of folks can't wait that long. Right, they've, right. They've got to produce. And you bring up that that uh, good point too when we talked weather and mm -hmm. again that cold and very wet early spring weather really does a number on both the nesting, the hatching even, mm -hmm. and then once they hatch. But you mentioned that the hens will re-nest. So if they're not successful, lose a nest, they will go back and try it again. Yeah, we, we find that the majority of our hens do re-nest. So if they try to lay a first clutch and it's unsuccessful, especially early on in the incubation period, most of the time they will you know go and try to lay it in another nest and hatch another nest sometimes if it happens later in the incubation period maybe they were a day or two from hatching and then a predator came by and mm -hmm. got their nest just because they invested all that time already and their energy is drained from right from doing they're doing that. double duty yeah though. they might they might not re-nest um it just depends as far as the second part of the question when right. bolts are old enough, enough to survive without the cover right. um you know their use of space and the habitats they can survive in, it changes, especially when they reach about two weeks old um, and they become more strong flyers and they can start flying and roosting in trees at night. And then how old? About two weeks old. Two weeks. Yeah, they can fly at about eight to nine days, but only into slow shrubs right. and things like right. that. It's not till they're about two that they start roosting in trees at night. Um, and so then 
you know, the, the ground roosting cover is not as important then. Then they need those roost sites up in trees that they would use with their, their mom hen. Um, and they also can, you know, as they get older and become more mobile, they can move through a lot of different habitat easier. It's really those first two weeks when they're really small is when the good ground cover that has a lot of insects and also enough open bare ground space for them to move easily. That's when that's really important. Problems. And again, the habitat, you know, you think of, say, just a dense field, mm -hmm. fescue, uh, things like that. Do they need that? What is that ideal habitat? Yeah, so a lot of times fescue and grasses that grow in mats that are really dense at the bottom, they don't have a lot of bare ground in between you know, they're not clump grasses like some of our mm -hmm. native warm season grasses. So there's not a lot of bare ground in between that the young colts can move through easily. So the fescue fields that a lot of turkeys will nest in them, right? But then usually they will move their brood out of that field into somewhere that's easier for them to move, at least until they're a bit older. And then they might come back into it if they can find good forage there. Um, but yeah, so it's, and, and, you know, older birds will use fescue for displaying areas because they like to be out in the open. Um, where a lot of, especially the males, like to be out in the open where hens can see oh, them. Sure, sure, like right. But but for broods, it can be tough for the young colts to move through. Okay, Mary also wants to know, um, you know, she mentioned the loss of ash trees specifically, but also you mentioned the the maturity of many of our forests where they're more dense and, you know, it's not that open savanna picture that we saw earlier. So how's that had an impact on the population? The changes in our forests and woodlands? So luckily here in Missouri, we don't usually have a, a shortage of roosting trees causing impacts on our turkey populations. That can be an impact to turkeys that live out west in where trees are more scarce and maybe only in riparian areas. Um, so as far as our forests, it's not really having an impact on the roost site part of the equation. It has more of an impact on the nesting and brood rearing site availability. Okay, good to know. Um, Steve wants to know, armadillos, what effects are they having on turkeys? And we know that they're kind of, they're moving naturally, moving north. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the impacts that we yeah, know about? We do know that armadillos will opportunistically take advantage of turkey nests when they come across them. Pretty much anything will, um, you know, from like deer to, you know. And, and armadillos, they, they're primarily insect eaters they are. and burrowers. So do they go after the eggs? They, or kind of the bugs around the nest. Yeah, so a lot of times they'll just be moving through the forest looking for bugs and things. That yeah, they're, they're kind of blind. And if they come across the turkey nest, they will use it. But as far as them seeking out a nest for a source of food, we're still not really sure that that's what's happening with, with armadillos right. and turkey nests. All right, Fred wants to know, what's the average life expectancy of a wild turkey? And is there a difference between males and females? Yeah, so... Typically, um, the females live a little bit longer than the males. They tend to live about three to four years. The males tend to live about two to three years. But most of that is due to the fact that we harvest a lot of males. Well, right. So, I mean, taking um, that factor. Adult male annual survival tends to be the lowest, and that's because their main source of survival is us. Um, you know, hens usually survive about 60% from year to year, and jakes have the, the highest survival because Fewer of them are being harvested, and they don't have to go through the perils of nesting right, and rearing young. Right. And so their survival can be 75% or greater on an, on an annual basis. Okay. Good to know. Thanks. So, Sean wants to know, we've been asking hunters for feathers for a research study. Can you quickly tell us what that study is about? Yeah, so we're looking for people who harvest the turkey in the fall to send in feathers from the bird they harvest. It's basically giving us some additional information that's going to refine models that we're building that will provide us with estimates of turkey abundance, survival rates, harvest rates, and uh, recruitment rates on an annual basis. So these models will allow us to say, you know, in this specific region of the state, we have 50,000 hen turkeys, give or take this amount. Um, the harvest rate of our hens in that region is 1%, give or take this amount. And that will allow us to better track our harvest rates so that if our hen harvest rates or our male harvest rates increase to something that's unsustainable, um, we can respond very quickly to that through uh, changing a regulation or, or making a change. Okay. And that's fascinating to know. I mean, all the information that you could really extract from something as simple as a turkey feather mm -hmm. and how that could ultimately over the long term benefit 
again, our turkey management. So yeah. fascinating. Um, let's see, somebody wants to know, any plans to conduct a similar turkey study in the southern part of the state? At this time, we don't have plans to conduct anything as in-depth as what we're doing up north just because of how time and resource intensive uh, that sort of work is. But I did mention, you know, we are looking at our harvest rates in the southern part of the state starting with this upcoming winter, um, just because we have had a lot of concern with folks that we could be over harvesting our males in the southern part of the state. So we just want to double check on that and try to get a better idea of what those rates are. Okay, very good to know. Um, we talked about, again, the impact of predators on nesting and things like that. And we were saying if you do it intensively on a small scale, it has a short-term advantage, but over the long term and on a large scale, really doesn't. So Steve wants to know, is managing predators during the nesting period really the most effective time? And then if so, is there any consideration being given for landowners to have that option? So yeah, like we talked about, there have been some studies that have shown right before or during the nesting season, removing those predators can have short-term positive impacts. And because of that, a lot of folks have been asking for that opportunity. Um, ultimately, you're still not gonna produce turkeys if you don't have good habitat. But for landowners that are already providing good nesting habitat and broodering habitat, you know, having a tool like that in their toolbox to be able to, to do that might be something that they want. And so when we go through our fur bearer regulatory review, that is something that we will consider. Um, we don't know exactly what that will look like, but we will be considering comments from folks um, and a lot of other, you know, just considerations of what our current seasons are and, and everything. So I would encourage folks if they're interested in seeing a change to our, you know, trapping, uh, our fur bearer trapping and hunting regulations that they keep an eye out for outreach opportunities uh, during that review because we will be looking for folks input on those regulations. Okay. Very good, very good to know. Um, it's a good segue. What are the top three things a landowner can do to help out with turkeys? Uh, habitat, habitat, habitat. Good answer. <laughs> but, but like, but, but specifically, like we've been talking about, it's that production side of the equation. So really, we're talking about spring and summer habitat. You know, our winter and fall survival is really high. So getting that herbaceous cover, especially flowering plants and things in your forests and in your open areas is really the best thing that you can and do. And again, these. you want quality wildlife habitat in open forest or savanna with a great mix of your native grasses, which tend to clump and not cover everything. There's open space. Yep. Flowers and forbs attract a lot of bugs, which the poults need to yeah. grow. Um, but in our in our forest mm -hmm. and people that manage you know forested areas, we we're talking you know cutting down some of those trees that are not you know high quality, um, you know, and basically releasing that canopy, allowing sunlight to come through and reach the forest floor. That's going to have a big impact and create good forage in your forested areas. So as thinning well. some dense yeah, woodlands exactly. is helpful. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to know: Does clear cutting though help out with production? Um, so clear cutting can help out with management of, of other species like, uh, you know, doing it in the right areas and making sure it doesn't get encroached by invasives can be really beneficial for like ruffed grouse. It can produce a lot of woody uh, shoots uh, that are small and dense and that can provide good habitat for them. Um, for turkeys, they don't, they don't need that intense level of management, just some timber stand improvement where, like I said, you just go through and pick out some of the not so good trees. Um, and cut those down to release some of the other better trees or open up the canopy is really That's all you need really to do. What you, you don't need, need to do, do anything that crazy. <laughs> okay, and folks, we're, uh, we're running out of time here, so let's see what we can get through. Um, somebody also wants to know, so if you're not a landowner, what can you do to help turkeys? Yeah, so that's tough for folks, right? Because not everybody manages their own piece of property, but they might know somebody who does. And so I would say, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family members who have property, um, see what they're doing or see if you can help them with management on their property or if they would be open to it. That's probably the best thing that you can do. And also participating in our brood survey and providing us with that information. You know, the, the more observations we get, the better that data is going to be um, and the better our management will be. Okay, uh, let's see. The youth season, which is earlier um, spring, does that disrupt breeding because it's earlier? So just because it's such a, a relatively small impact with the amount of participation mm -hmm. and the period of time, 
not really know. I there was I think a lot of compromising that went into play when we were creating that youth season. Folks didn't want it to occur the weekend before our regular season opened because they thought that it would they'd push the birds around and disrupt right. them right before the regular season mm -hmm. opened. So having it, you know, nine days before was kind of a compromise of it not being too early, but also giving the birds a chance to rest in between the youth season and the opening of the regular season. Okay. Um, if somebody finds a turkey nest, can they do anything to help it? Just leave it alone. Mom will come back. Okay. And, and that's yeah. a good reminder with this a time of, of year, a things. lot of yeah. young wildlife, they may appear orphan, they're not. Mm -hmm. Leave them alone. Mom will come back, let nature kind of take its course. Exactly. Um, the last question, again, if it's weather causing problems or is it flooding from rivers and streams or all of the above? What's the weather factor in the early spring that really kills like the nesting and the poles? Yeah, so the, it really just takes precipitation in the form of rain. The mechanism that occurs is when the hens get wet, they get stinky. And so when they're wet a lot, it can be easier for predators to locate them. And so that's that we call it the wet hen hypothesis. So it doesn't necessarily mean nests are getting flooded out. It just means that hens are easier to find. And then for poults, when they're really young and they have just downy feathers, they can't thermoregulate very well and they can't shed water very well. So if you get a lot of wet rain um you know when they're young they can die of hypothermia quite right easily. and that's either by getting rained on or if they're in an area that even has a few inches of kind of flooding they have to go through that well then they might drown <laughs> and then they might drown i mean yeah. not only may they just die from hypothermia because <laughs> yeah. they can't regulate yeah. but they could drown so we it's would hope both, mom wouldn't take them through that <laughs> right but it's both flooding it's the cold it's, spring rains because they yeah. can't regulate and it doesn't the stinky need, hen theory. But yeah, it doesn't need to be as extreme as flooding. Um, it can just be a lot of precipitation in general. Okay. Well, Raina, thank you so much. And folks, thank you for joining us. We're about out of time here. Um, Raina, appreciate all of the information and folks appreciate your interest in that. So thank you for joining us. If you'd like to see this or our other previous wild webcasts, if you know somebody who missed it today or you want to go back and rewatch, please visit us online at mdc.mo.gov and simply use our search tool to search wild webcasts. So Raina, participants, everyone, thanks again. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. It was, and thank you for all of your great questions. All right, and get outside, discover nature. Have a great day.